live. People are uh, texting, wanting to know we're having church tonight. And, uh, and so here we are. All right, I guess my clock is a little bit off. And, uh, but we want everybody to join us, and the answer is yes, we are having church. And uh, don't forget to visit our website at lyitl.org. And the good news is we're slowly rebuilding. And we got some other sites out there that uh, we had that we lost, got those rebuilt. And it's just, we're just talking years of work, and we're having to put it back. So we're going to take and keep everything going for the glory of God. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you uh, tonight about uh, a man called Elijah. And why was he so special? And what did he come up with? And there's one thing in there. There's a word called strength, which means power, right? So watch carefully, if you will, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1 through 16. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and, and more also, if I make uh, not thy life at, as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Now, wait a minute. Think about this. Back in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 38, uh, God used him uh, to intercede, and he, and he watched 450 prophets of Baal be destroyed. But see, it doesn't take a lot to knock the wind out of you. So here we are in 1 Kings chapter 19. Let's move on down here to verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And he said, It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And as he lay there and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. We're going to talk about that today. And he, lo and he looked, and behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, and what? And touched him, or in other words, nudged him, touched him, and said, Arise and eat. And apparently he must have said it pretty forcefully. And he says, Because the journey is too great for thee. We'll stop there for a moment there. We'll come back and pick up in verse number 8. But I want you to understand that the word strength means power. And God gave Elijah the strength. Guess what, uh, Lady Karen? In his weakest hour. In his weakest hour. And the journey we as Christians, I believe, must make uh, is too great for us to make it within ourselves. It's too easy to get the, wind, the spiritual wind knocked out of you, isn't it? You know, as we were, as our church was going forward and whenever COVID hit, uh, we saw the numbers go down. And not just us, but everybody in town. And then people got used to just sitting in their lazy chair and watching it on TV. But Hebrews 10 25 says what? not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much as they're approaching. So there was a command uh, from Jesus not to neglect the house of worship, the place where we offer encouragement one to another. So we all have a journey that we're going to take. And I know, Lady Tigger, we're talking about you. You're on a new journey. You know, praise God for that brand new job you've got. And, and uh, Lady Karen, she's got a new job. And, and uh, uh, you know, and, and, I, and what's amazing is, oh, hey, Ann, good to see you. God bless you too. And uh, but we're in First Kings chapter nineteen. We read down from verses one through eight. We're going to go through verse sixteen a little bit. But I want you to understand that God is going to give strength in your weakest hour. And so Paul said in Philippians four thirteen, I can do all things. Notice through Christ, which strengthens me. You see, sometimes I get the wind knocked out. I mean, just like you, I'm, I'm a human being. And, and, I, and yeah, I jump back in. What keeps me going is getting back into the routine of serving God. And that makes a difference, all right? So what do we know about Elijah? Number one on your outline, what do we know? Elijah was a man of prayer. Now, I want you to go back and look at, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse number 38. Now, this was amazing. And it says, 
And then the fire of the Lord. Let's go back to verse 37. Okay. Hear me, O Lord. Hear me this. This people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell uh, uh, in the midst, consuming the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and the wicked up in the water that was in the trench. Verse 39. And then all the people saw it. They fell on the ground on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is our God. The Lord, He is our God. So you got to see this great revival take place. And uh, God worked in a, in a supernatural way. What did He do? Uh, uh, Elijah prayed. Elijah prayed. In fact, let's go back a little farther if you know your Bible. Uh, Elijah prayed that there'd be a drought. Did you know that? So there was a drought in all the land. And uh, now, he's, the eyes, and of course, he's going to pray for a rain to come down in such a way that it's going to be just like a storm. And here in Lubbock, you kind of get an idea of what it means to have the rain come down. It's out of nowhere. I mean, it'll knock you down, you know. But so, in other words, there was a miracle that was going to take place. And he just witnessed that. But then he, he allows one person. Oh, somebody say, oh, me. He allowed one person to knock the wind out of him. Does anybody remember her name? Jezebel. And Jezebel was a very, very wicked queen, right? And so she challenged him and said, if, if, if I don't destroy you by tomorrow, then may, may they, uh, uh, gods, do to me what I did, what you saw up there. So in other words, there's this challenge. What, what did he do? He's tired. He's weary. He's getting weak. When you get weak physically, you get weak mentally. When you get weak physically, mentally, you're going to get weak, what? Spiritually, all right? So Elijah, though, we know, was a man of prayer. He had just prayed for the fire to come down from heaven in 1 Kings chapter 18. We, don't, we talked about that. And what was the result? In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 22, 450 false prophets were destroyed before his eyes. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about 450 people. That's a lot. And, and yet they're destroyed. In fact, the, uh, the burnt offering that was there, God, he sucked all that up. And all the water out in the desert poured around that. He sucked all that up. I mean, whew, you thought it was a Lubbock tornado came through there, right? And, but yet, the fact is, Elijah was a man of prayer. And that's what I want you to grab tonight. And whenever we, you and I uh, get our prayer life straight, we're going to get some power. Of what By power, I mean strength. To carry on and do what needs to be done in these last days. So Elijah was a man of prayer. Number two, uh, looking at Israel's spiritual weakness, Elijah became weak. Now, this is important. Looking, He was looking at what? Israel's spiritual weakness and Elijah became weak. One of the most uh, disheartening things to a Christian is to see people who have quit serving God. You know, it's amazing. I, I've been doing this thing for a long time. And Lady Karen, I run across people and say, well, I, I used to drive a bus. I used to sing in the choir. I used to come in, in for the prayer service before every service. I used to be involved in, in children's church or maybe the teen group, you know. I used to. So looking at Israel's spiritual weakness, Elijah became weak. So what's the lesson? If you hang around weak people, what are you going to become? It's going to have an influence on you, right? But if you hang around strong people, what are you going to become? Strong. And that's the reason why Hebrews 10.25 shouts out, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Why? Because if you start... It, it, I've seen it for all the years. People come and get saved, get baptized, they're all excited about Jesus. And then you have to go to work on Monday and they go, a lot of the excitement is gone. And, uh, but they're coming to Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And after about a couple of weeks and everything, uh, they start missing one service. Next thing you know, they're missing two services. Next thing you know, they're missing three. And the next thing you know, they're just missing. And I've seen it way too many times. If people under, Jesus understood that as human beings that we should collect ourselves together. We've got friends uh, you know, around the world, and Ann, we're glad you're on here. Ann's a good uh, a friend of ours, and and uh, we we chat back and forth and check in on each other. And and uh, but even though they, they she used to be here in Lubbock, but uh, she, she lives far away. But you know what? 
Well, it's not going to hurt you one bit to pick up a phone and offer some encouragement, right? Stay in touch. Stay in touch. Why? If you can't stay in touch locally, stay in touch long distance. So what do you do? Elijah was a man of prayer. That teaches me that if I want, if I want power in my life, it's not about quoting a scripture. I, I get so frustrated sometimes when people think they just quote a scripture and it's, it's going to just be bam, done. No, Elijah, he sought God. He prayed to God. He prayed to God. He prayed to God. He prayed to God. He was in, in that spiritual realm where Lady Karen, he was so tuned in to God that he was able to reach God with his own prayers. Does that make sense? You know what's really amazing? Is that, uh, uh, and I'm not trying to call it, make anybody upset, but uh, whenever you see people, uh, there's a deal called a rosary. I, I was, you know, raised partially Catholic. And, but that rosary, people repeat the same prayer over and over and over and over and over and over. I want to give you a newsflash. God heard you the first time. Amen. And he understood you, your language, the first time, Amen. right? But it doesn't hurt to seek God and say, God, we're looking for this. In fact, he said, I want you to pray for laborers in the field. And so what do we do? Every day, I pray for laborers to come in and help us out. And you say, well, where are the laborers? They're in the field. They're still in the field. And Starla, we got to get them out. Glad to have you. We got to get them out of the field and back into the house of God. Amen. And this is where we see transformations take place here. Uh, I, I, I've gone out and had Bible studies with people, but the real transformation, man, I've seen more transformations happen inside of a gospel service that is Holy Spirit filled. And people are saying, I want to seek God. I want to be moved by God. And, and they couldn't wait. I miss you. We're so glad to have you. Uh, they, they couldn't wait to get to the altar. And they, they spent a long time there just getting things either right or just seeking God or praying for people. Man, I'm telling you, uh, I remember, I hate to say this, we used to have prayer warriors in our church. And they would come in 30 minutes early and they'd go back in the back and immediately they'd get on their knees before God. They'd be praying for the service specifically. And some people stayed back there and prayed while I preached. You say, well, why did the church grow so fast? I think it was because of those prayer warriors. Les, we're glad to have you. Uh, we're in 1 Kings chapter 19. So uh, we're talking about, you know, the power that Elijah found is, was at his weakest hour. When you're weak, that's when you ought to really seek God the most, right? That's why Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, listen, through Christ which strengthens me. God understands that we are flesh. Now, we like, like to think we operate in the spirit all the time, but sometimes our flesh just gets weary. Sometimes we, we get upset. Uh, if you drive through Lubbock, you're going to get upset. I mean, I mean you're going to see people waving at you with things that you shouldn't do, right? I got really tickled at one lady that, that, uh, uh, that she didn't attend our church, but her family did. And she, I went to visit them, and uh, she told her story. And they were talking about her aunt and said that they were on the Loop 289 going around Lubbock. And this car came up beside them. And, it's, you know, sometimes you just can't slow down. You can't get out of their way because there's traffic there. So they should, you know, kind of work with that and yield on. Well, this guy got so mad he waved one finger at her. Now, you got to understand this lady is about 85. She thought, that's bad. She said, here, take them off. Well, she just stuck those out the window. And, you know, sometimes we don't respond <laughs> like we should, right? But she didn't know. She was innocent. She thought, well, if one finger's bad, then he can have all five of them, you know. And that guy just looked at her so funny, and, but they made it. Nobody had a wreck. But, you know, sometimes we, we take things wrong. And sometimes the world has a way of trying to not only knock the breath out of us, but to get us out of serving God. So Elijah was a man of prayer. And because of that, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 22, he, went, he witnessed 450 false prophets destroyed before his very eyes. Now we're going to move on down a little bit later. Here we are in uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. And so looking at Israel's spiritual weakness, Elijah became weak. And again, I say it again, the most disheartening thing to a pastor or to a Christian is to see people who, they just quit serving God. They quit going to church. They quit encouraging each other. Uh, we've had people that just come up and vanished and we, we thought aliens got them. You know, we couldn't reach them by phone. We, and so, but sometimes people just disappear in thin air. So Israel, 
And we know had broken her, vow, her vows to God. We also know they built altars to Baal. And they had forsaken the Lord God. So Elijah is going to have to deal with this. God's going to send him and try to get the message across. So back, back in the Old Testament, when a prophet showed up, that wasn't a good thing. Now you say, well, well he's an evangelist. No, he was a prophet. And normally they're saying, if you don't get it right, judgment's coming, right? So once again, uh, we, we find him in, in uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, that he's threatened by Jezebel. He's threatened. It, it will make your life like the, uh, shall make your life like the rest of those guys. There's 450 that died. And, and yet he, he just seen God destroy 450 prophets. He let one person, one person, and she didn't even go to him. She sent a messenger. How many know that, uh, that sometimes people that you love and care about, uh, sometimes the greatest damage is sometimes by our closest friends and family. Amen. And yet we had to hear it through somebody else, right? But that was enough. She sent a messenger. Let's go back and look at this. Verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So, well, I bet he's watching the clock, isn't he? And you know what he says? God, just let me die. Just let me die. So he was threatened by Jezebel. I think we've all got some Jezebels in our life. I hope you're not a Jezebel. Uh, but I hope we're sowing seeds of encouragement and love and kindness and trying to encourage get the gospel out. But often, Elijah, he was a man of prayer, but he's also flesh, which means he looked at Israel's what? Spiritual weakness, and he became weak. I'm telling you right now, the people that used to be really strong in our churches, they're not as strong as they used to be. A lot of people have quit reading their Bible on their own. They've quit seeking God and asking God to perform a miracle uh, that we might be able to take and and see the enemy of God taken down and, and, and the people of God risen up. But so often we don't take our problems to, to God. We, we put it on Facebook. And I don't know about you, but I just pass that stuff right up. I don't want to be in that drama. But you see, what was the problem? Why, why, were, they, why were they weak? Well, Israel had broken her vows to God. And built altars to Baal. And they had forsaken the Lord their God. So let me think about that. How does that relate to us? Well, Israel had broken her vows to God. I wonder, have we broken our vows to God? God, I promise if you'll just fix my marriage, I promise if you'll just get me a job, I promise if you'll just take care of so-and-so, <laughs> I promise. And, you know, the Bible says if you make a, a prayer request, a covenant with God, and you break it, it's not a good thing. God's going to hold you to your word. So Israel had broken her vows to God. I wonder how many times we might have broken a vow or a promise that we've made. And then they built altars to Baal. And you know that's where they worship something more than God. And so what I'm seeing here in, the, in these last days is people used to come in. This, this place used to be so packed. Lady Karen, if you never saw it way back then, it would have blown your mind. I mean, chairs, people down the hallways, people in the foyer. We had speakers out there, and people were getting on their knees, getting saved. And, and hi, Catherine and James, glad to see you. And so I remember that. What I hate to say, we used to have those numbers. But what are you doing now? Oh, I'm still keeping the doors open here. So what are you looking for? Laborers. Where are they? Well, they're not in the back room. I didn't check that. They're out in the field. So we need to go out in the field, and that's our houses, our neighbors, all through Lubbock, knocking doors. There's somebody just waiting for you to invite them. Most of us here, uh, now mine was, I got invited to this church. Y'all know that? I, I was just a young little preacher boy, and, and yet uh, that they had lost uh, uh, Brother Lot, their pastor, and they were looking for a pastor. And we came, they called me and said, hey, would you come up and, and, and preach for us? And I did. And, I brought my guitar and I sang for them. That's why two people left, I believe. But, but well, I, I played the guitar and, and I was a bus man. I, I wanted to get a bus and, and I wanted to see this thing grow. And, and uh, they said, well, we don't have a lot of money, uh, you know, and everything. So it wasn't about the money, but, you know, we started out $200 a week. 
Boy, that'd be nice to have that right now, you know? But we don't take a salary. But back then, we had to. We had to provide for ourselves. But here's what I saw God do. God saw a, a heart that wanted to see God's success in his life. I wanted to see this build, building filled with people that would worship God and love God. And, and uh, tears would fill their eyes when they think about Jesus Christ, and, you know. But some of those days, I hate to say it, sometimes you feel like they're gone. Uh, so what do you do? Well, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So I learned, Christ can strengthen me. If he can strengthen me, he can strengthen you, all right? So just make sure you haven't broken your vows. God, I, I want you to save me, and, and God, I want to be that one that uh, I'm going to go out and soul win. I'm going to drive that bus. I'm going to take care of that children's church class. And, and you made those vows to God. But somewhere down the line, somebody got your feelings hurt. So that's in our text, isn't it? He got his feelings hurt. Everybody help me with the magic word. Wah. All right? Wah. Get over it. All right? Well, they, they, they hurt my feelings. Well, you know what? I went to Walmart the other day. They didn't have what I needed. They hurt my feelings. Well, I bet I go back to Walmart. You know? And so what I'm saying, hey, all I can tell you is that you got to have some common sense in these days. But you have to ask yourself, am I really, really seeking God in my life? How's your prayer life? Is it only when you need something? How's your prayer life? Because your prayer life becomes your power life. Do you get that? You won't have any power to witness without the Holy Spirit. Don't believe me? Go back and read Acts uh, you know, chapter uh, 1 verse 8. He said you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. That doesn't mean you're going to jump around. It means you're going to have the confidence to know that the Holy Spirit will help you to remember uh, scriptures. And if you learn them, you memorize them, he's going to let you, he's going to take and, and move in your spirit. He's going to give you confidence. He's going to give you authority. And you're going to do things you never thought you'd do. But so often we try to build the church without God, without the Holy Spirit. So, number three. So, we talked about number one, Elijah was a man of prayer. Number two, he looked at Israel's spiritual weakness, and Elijah became weak. Who are you hanging around? Where's, where's your zeal? Well, I, I'm hanging around these people. Well, you might need to come out from among them, be a separate, said the Lord. And, but the threat of Jezebel knocked the wind out of him. Now, let's look at number four. What was Elijah's conclusion? He said this, Elijah, at this point, is in a backslidden state, all right? He says, Jezebel is going to slay me. Well, and he says, I and even I am the only one living for God. Elijah said, Lord, let me die, you know? So he prayed to God, but you know what? God didn't answer that prayer because God still has some things for him to do. In fact, number five, uh, Elijah hears from God. How's he hear from God? God's going to send an angel. Let's go back to our, our scriptures. 1 Kings uh, 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 chapter, uh, uh, chapter 19, we left off in verse 7, I believe. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, touched him, and said, Arise and eat. How many know it would do us good just to get up early? Lady Karen is getting up early now. She says, I don't think I like this. <laughs> so, but arise and eat. Now, notice this. My mama could cook. Did you know that? Man, she could cook. But if she cooked our meal... In the morning, we were hungry at lunch. That meal didn't last. But he's going to, that's one meal from God is going to last him and give him strength to travel a long journey. Look what he says here. He says in verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise me, because the journey is too great for thee. On your own, you won't make it. Some of you need to realize that today, that, we're not going to build a church on our own. God has to build it. We know that. You're not going to build a great marriage on your own. God's going to have to do that for you. And the list goes on and on. Verse nine, number 8. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the what? The strength that meet 40 days and 40 nights and to Horeb, Mount of God. Lady Karen, wouldn't that be great to eat one meal and not have to eat any more for 40 days? And have the strength, not be hungry? Have the power. I bet he got trimmed up. What are you going to bet? But, it, but God gave him strength through his meal. And our meal is when we read the word of God every day. I tell everybody you should be reading something out of Proverbs and Psalms every day. 
And if you haven't been in, in the book of St. John in a while, go back and read that. It talks about all the things and miracles that Jesus did. It'll encourage you. You'll see him not as, as, a, as just some Bible character, but you'll see him as God. All right? So verse 9, And he came thither into a cave, lodged there, and behold, the sword of the Lord came to him, and, and he said to him, What dost thou hear, Elijah? Sometimes God questions our actions, doesn't he? All right? And that's good. But verse 10 says, He said, I have been very jealous for, uh, for the Lord God of the host, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and have slain the prophets with the sword. And I, even I alone, uh, uh, he says, uh, they seek my life to take it away. Everybody say, wah. wah. All right. So here's the deal. He lied. You know what he did? He made an excuse. He's making an excuse. He said, and he said, I have been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts. Well, what does that have to do with this now? He said, he said I, I watched the people. And they, they don't want to serve you. They don't want to love you. And he said, you know, it just knocked the wind out of me. And I and only I. So outside that verse, right, pity party. He's having a pity party, right? Verse 11. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong, uh, 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 I'm sorry, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and breaking into pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. But and after that the wind and earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after that the earthquake and fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, still small voice. Isn't that something? All God had to do is think it. He's standing on this rock. He's in a cave. He comes out, and I mean, Armageddon is taking place right now. I mean, total destruction. And yet, God didn't want him to, to put his trust in the big dynamics. It was the voice of God. He heard the voice of God. How many of you ever felt the voice of God in your spirit? You just knew you needed to do something, need to call somebody. You know, uh, there were times that, that we, we, Lady Karen had, had a heart from one of the men of the uh, uh, old you know, the nursing home that where her mother had been that time and he'd gone to the hospital and boy, the Lord burdened your heart and you and I went up there and talked to him and, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, I said, just curious, I knew he was in bad shape. I said, have you ever asked Jesus into your heart? He says, no, I don't think, and he's kind of saying that he's not good enough. I said, none of us are. But I began to talk and reason with him and I began to read scriptures to him that I'd memorized and then uh, I'll go ahead and give you his, well, I better not give his name, but anyway, uh, laying there in a hospital bed, he asked Jesus to come in his heart. And I would have never been up there to even present the gospel if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit leading my wife, saying, we, we need to go visit him. You see, you, you ought to, when, when you get that in your heart, that's called a prompting. And if you get prompted, you need to follow up on it. Does that make sense? So here it is. He says, now this is amazing. He says, and after the earthquake, a fire, and the Lord was not in the fire. And, and after that, the fire, a small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he what? He wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What dost thou hear, Elijah? He just asked that question in verse 9, didn't he? But hopefully God's allowed him to experience something that would change his mind. In verse 14, and he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain the prophets with the sword. And I and I am, am, am only am left. And, and they seek my life to, to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go and return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, uh, anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. Now wait a minute. The prophet is going to go to, down there and appoint a king. God says, we got to get these people. Out. We're going to reach these people. We're going to put some people in strategic places, all right? Verse 16. And Jehu, the son of, of Nimash, uh, sh uh, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of, uh, of uh, uh, Shaphat, uh, Abimelech, uh, 
And they're like, I don't have my glasses, guys, so you have to bear with me, all right? And he says, that thou shalt what? Anoint him to be what? To be a prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him and that escapes the sword of, the, of Hazel shall Jehu slay. And him they escape from the sword. Jehu shall what? Uh, uh, Elisha slay, slay, slay. Verse 18. Yet I, listen to this right here. I have left me 7,000 in Israel. All the knees which have not bowed unto Baal. And every mouth which has uh, not kissed him. Now let's stop there for a moment. You know what he just did to Elijah? He done away with Elijah's excuses. I'm the only one left, God. This is it. I throw my hands up. He said, oh, come on. Go down and anoint a couple of guys like I asked you to do. Let me king. And then he's going to see him on a journey a little bit later to, to a widow. And you probably know that story. You see, a lot of us have given up on God, but God hasn't given up on us. God still got a plan for you. And you say, yeah, but I've been through a divorce. Wah, all right. Well, I lost my job. Wah, you know. And, and somebody at church, they hurt my feelings. Wah, you know. They quit having donuts now. And they get this, this great food that's supposed to make you get healed or something, you know. And, uh, and they didn't have the coffee pot on, so I'm not going back to that church. Wah. Listen, get serious about serving your God. If he's really God... Then, and, and then and sometimes we're the only Bible somebody ever reads. Why would anybody want my God if I can't go to church? Why would anybody want my God if I can't take and read the Word of God to somebody? Why would somebody want my God if they don't see a change in my life, a transformation? So Elijah hears from God. So God sends down an angel, sends bread from heaven, sends a cruise of water. God said, Arise, eat for the journey you're about to take. It's too great for thee. You're going to get hungry. So I want you to eat this. This is, this is the manna from God. How many of you know that what we need today is to feast on God's word and God's promises? You know, all the, the singing we do and all the stuff we try to do, uh, that's not going to sustain you. I think it's what God said, uh, not to forsake the assembly of yourselves together. Why? Wednesday night's important. Sunday morning's important. Sunday night's important. Why? We're assembling together. We had a revival on Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday is important. Does that make sense? So are you ready for this? God was not ready for Elijah to die. All right? God said, I want you to touch somebody. Now, wait a minute. I want you to anoint Hazel to be the king of Syria and Jehu the king of Israel. You see, there is someone we can touch for God. Now, God's going to use you, if you let him, to touch some people for God. Jesus said, and I like this. This will be our last scriptures, I, these, these two right here. I want you to turn to St. John chapter 7. I want all of us to read this, all right? St. John chapter 7, verse number 38 and 39. Because Jesus is going to tell us that out of the belly shall flow what? Rivers of living water. But he spake of the Holy Spirit. He tells me to see a capital letter S. That means God and the Holy Spirit. And uh, we're glad to have you too. I'm not sure if I know how to. And I call you Emmanuel. And we're so glad to have you here with us. Yeah, or Annie. All right. So uh, as we close this down. Turn to St. John chapter 7. Verse 38 through 39. Now watch this. He that believeth on me. As the scripture has said. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. And for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So whenever Jesus died on the cross, he said, I have to die. So, so when I leave, I can send the Holy Spirit. Now think about this. God, for God to appear to man, he became flesh. Jesus, right? And Jesus, uh, uh, whenever uh, he died and everything and rose and went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit. Now we got Jesus in spiritual form. So he said, Elijah did rise and eat. He obeyed God. He ate the bread and he drank the curse of water and, and a cruise of water. And he went down on that street for 40 days. That's great. But think about this. God still has a plan for him. He has a plan for you. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you, look at this, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. 
That's why it's important you read your Bible. Because if you don't read your Bible, the Holy Spirit, He reaches in that bag of tricks inside of you and goes, it's empty. But if you'll start reading your Bible, you'll be amazed that when you get in the right place at the right time, and, and it might not be in church, it could be with someone that, that, uh, that, you know, that we've met on the street, it might be someone you work with, but you know what? When you start to talk to that person, it's going to be like a river of water, the words of God that are going to flow out of you. But you've got to fill up that belly with the Word of God. What does it mean? Well, Acts chapter 2 talks about power, praise, and purpose. Uh, to do what Jesus says to do. In Acts chapter 2, they assembled in the upper room, and guess what? All of a sudden, Lady Karen, everybody that was in that upper room began to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, whatever language they spoke, and if you go back and read it, it says everybody heard them speak in their own language the things of God, and that's why 3,000 souls got saved. And guess who was the one preaching it? John. You get that? So what, what are you talking about? I'm saying that no matter where you are, God, listen, this church is not limited to these walls. All over this city are people seeking God. And, and if we'll knock on the door and we'll hand them a track and talk to them, start a conversation, wouldn't that be great if a lot of people got saved? And when they get saved, what do we do? We, we, we put duct tape on them. We drag them to church. We fill up the baptistry. We tell them we hope they float. No. But the Bible does say to compel them. You know what that means? It means to get a hold of them and say, this is really, really important. If you're going to grow in a spiritual way, this is really important that you come. Hear the word of God. Get under the word of God. And the Sunday school, the Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. Hey, this is where you're going to get filled up with nourishment because you're going to get the wind knocked out of you on Monday and Tuesday. You need to, to take it and, and have a little bit of a uh, from God. Amen. A breath from God. So what do you do? I encourage you to go back and read Acts chapter 2. Man, everybody got excited about Jesus. You know, day of Pentecost, Penta, you know, it's 50, and the cost was the cost of Calvary. So after Calvary, 50 days later, woo, they're all together, and the Holy Spirit comes down and just, man, he fills up everybody. Everybody's got courage, they got stamina, they got power. And so they, they, they've got power, they got praise, they got purpose to do what Jesus sent them to do. To tell somebody what Jesus did 50 days ago in Paul's day. But you know what? I don't know, but if you'll experience God, you got a story to tell. You got a testimony to tell. Let me tell you what God has done for me. He, he made a transformation in my mind and in my heart and in my walk. And then invite them, would you like to meet my Jesus? How do you do that? You pull out a, a Bible or a gospel tract and you let them understand that they're a sinner in need of a savior. And that Savior is Jesus. That he arose on the third day. He's alive forevermore. And if they will just but ask him. For whosoever shall call. Romans 10, 13. For whosoever shall call upon the Lord. Shall be what? Saved. Probably the easiest verse in the world is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever what? Say it again. Believe in him. Even believe. That means to, to receive him. Believe in him. Should not perish. But have what? Everlasting. Everlasting life. Just read the Bible. Become strong in it. Father, we love you. And I pray, that, I thank you for those that are here and those that are on Facebook. And I pray people will take a like it and share it. There might be somebody out there that, that we couldn't reach door to door. But because somebody shared it, they got to hear something that touched their heart. Maybe their, their, their life has fallen apart. Maybe they've lost their job. Maybe they're ill. Maybe they're, maybe they're going through a divorce. Maybe some things have happened to their children or their grandchildren. And they just got this drama going on. And Lord, we need to get them saved so they'll say, hey, I've got a Savior that's going to carry me through all this. He's going to give me strength to make it through. So if anyone here that's not saved, then I want you to think about your condition. I want you to take and realize that without Jesus, then there's only one destiny, and that's a place called hell. But if you'll ask Jesus to save you, he'll give you heaven instead. It goes like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. 
And I know you're the Savior. And I'm asking you the best I know how. Please come in my heart and into my life. Save me once and for all. Help me to go through the transformation that I can live my life to bring honor and glory to your name. I thank you for that. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that has now sealed my salvation. That no man can pluck you out of thy Father's hand. I and my Father are one. You told us that. Nobody can unsave themselves. Nobody can take away what God gave them. I pray that somebody will hear that message and ask God even right now to come to their heart and life. Amen. And if you did that, don't forget to go to our website, lyitl.org, and send us a, an email and let us know. We want to make sure that you have enough information that you can grow in the Lord. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in.